Welcome, everybody. Uh, my name is Gideon Rose. I'm the editor of Foreign Affairs, and welcome to another Foreign Affairs Live. Tonight's a special uh, event in this special series. Uh, we have the distinct pleasure of being here with Frank Fukuyama. Uh, if there is such a thing as the social scientist and public intellectual as rock star, uh, uh, he is what it is. Uh, people have talked about the Kennan sweepstakes for coming up with uh, uh, great slogans and uh, catchphrases that capture the era. Uh, I think Frank uh, was the first and probably the most lasting uh, to do so in the, the last generation and has continued to throw out a stream of extraordinary works. And for the political science nerds in the Harvard government department and so forth uh, uh, who can only look at him with uh, admiration and marvel at how you can manage to make yourself a public intellectual household name, uh, uh, he is a, a role model and an enriching uh, the entire culture uh, overall. Uh, so we have, without Thank further ado, let's, uh, let's get into this. Um, uh, first, let me tell everybody to silence all your cell phones and uh, uh, anything else electronically you have on you. Um, the, uh, the event tonight is going to be uh, uh, public, so it's on the record. Um, the Frank has done, you know, it's, it's, when you have an evening with uh, Fukuyama, it is very difficult to know what to focus on. Uh, because he has written so many important uh, works on so many major grade A questions. People have said that contemporary social scientists have an instinct for the capillary, uh, <laughs> and Frank is the exact opposite of that trend. Uh, he uh, goes after grade A questions, and uh, one after the other. But tonight I want to focus particularly on the questions of development, uh, political, economic, social which is a topic that is not only incredibly important and constantly in the news, but one that you've been noodling around for a whole variety of, uh, 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 of projects in the last uh, generation, essentially. So let's, let's start with that. Um, you shot to stardom publicly uh, with the end of history. Uh, first an article in the National Interest, uh, and then uh, uh, an excellent book. Um, the argument there was that there was a kind of logic to development and modernization and that the events of 89 and the collapse of the Soviet Union essentially sort of uh, confirmed that there was an essential model and a directionality to history and that we were seeing it emerge. Uh, do you, first of all, is that an accurate characterization of your thesis? And uh, what were you thinking when you wrote that? And do you still basically agree with that uh, approach? It's pretty good, Gideon. I think you got it right. Um, it was a really simple observation that uh, we had been living under this uh, view promoted by Marx and, and Marxism that there was this thing called modernization, that societies were developing along a certain coherent path, and their view was the end of history. And by the way, the end of history was not my idea. It was really coined by Hegel, the philosopher Hegel, and Marx had the concept of the end of history. But their end of history was going to be some version of a communist utopia. And I wrote this article uh, sitting, uh, <laughs> actually, I was in Las Vegas when I wrote part of it. Uh, um, <laughs> uh, yeah, it should have. Uh, but, um, and, and it, this was in the winter of 88, 89. And it, you know, I was following the Soviet Union closely. And just I said to myself, we're never going to get to this end of history. We're going to get off at the train station next to the end of history, which was bourgeois liberal democracy. And, there, you know, and I didn't have a hard uh, you know, view of, of a determinist view that everybody would have to inevitably get there. But it just seemed to me that the Marxist one wasn't going to happen and that the only reasonable uh, alternative for any country that wanted to be modern was some version of liberal democracy. And I think despite the rise of China and all of the troubles of modern democracies, that's still the case. Uh, in fact, that was the message I actually took from your culling of all these articles from foreign affairs uh, from the last 90 years. Well, I'm still there. And yeah. I, I, uh, you seem to have moved on. So let's get to that, uh, which is you, know, you, you take a bunch of other topics on in other books, uh, trust, uh, the post-human future, and biotechnology. You get, back, get sucked back into foreign policy after 9-11 uh, and, and your break with the neocons and so forth. But you then turn back on a large scale to questions of political order, 
uh, when you are asked to do the introduction for our former advisor's uh, uh, a new edition of our former advisor's work, mm -hmm. which ultimately becomes your, what may become your magnum opus, a two-volume project on the origins of political order. Talk about, mm -hmm. A, how you got into that project, B, what the project is, and C, why you felt the need to revisit the questions you right. had dealt with in the end of history. Yeah, well, I'm 30 years older, and I've thought about a lot of things since then. I actually know more about the world, because I wrote that original article when I was in my early 30s. Um, but, but actually the proxy... No lack of hubris in the pronouncements you were making. Yeah, that's right. Well, <laughs> only a young person can say some of those things. Um, but no, it had a very specific origin, which was uh, I, after September 11th, I started thinking a lot about the nation-building projects were ongoing in Afghanistan and Iraq and how little we actually knew about how to create a functional state where nothing uh, like that existed. And at the time, I was running an international development program at Johns Hopkins Science uh, in, in Washington, training students to go out in the field and help with this kind of project. And it occurred to me, you know, we don't have the first idea of how states uh, originally came into being. We understand how that there's this country called Denmark that works pretty well. It's stable, democratic, prosperous. Uh, but, you know, how do you become a country like Denmark? And we had this very unrealistic set of expectations that you could take these societies and turn them into some functional equivalent of Denmark you know, by applying enough resources and technical support uh, and so forth. And so that's the point at which I said, well, I have to do some homework myself and rethink this whole question about the development of institutions. And I would say that between the end of history and where I am today, that's the, you know, that's the biggest insight that I've had is that the development of institutions, uh, it's not just enough to have the idea. You have to have institutions which are deeply embedded patterns of behavior that are not dependent on individuals but last over time. And creating those institutions is actually an extremely hard uh, thing. And, and I think in the, in the you know, whatever, there, I, I don't think that the first book was actually that deterministic that you had to proceed al along this modernization course. But I think in the current book, uh, one of the underlying themes is that actually to get to modern liberal democracy uh, required a lot of fortuitous accidents. And so, for example, just democracy itself, uh, the idea of parliamentary democracy came about because in one European country, a feudal institution managed to survive into the modern age. That feudal institution was the estate or parliament, uh, which used to be the platform by which elites in the society could you know, hold the king back by not granting him taxes. Every other European society, just about, uh, the king managed to crush the parliament and create an absolutist monarchy, except in England, where the parliament, for religious and cultural, you know, historical reasons, uh, fought the king to a standoff in a civil war, created a constitutional system. And that glorious revolution in the late 17th century leads John Locke to write the second treatise on government, which then becomes the foundation for the principle no taxation without representation that is at the core of the American Revolution, then uh, American democracy. But that wouldn't have happened but for these, you know, this kind of accidental concatenation building off of a, an institution which was not democratic at all to begin with. And so I think you know, there's a lot of that in history. I want to get to that question of contingency and path dependency and so forth in a second. But let me walk back a little bit. This new uh, book is a two-volume survey, uh, yeah, very modest, by the way, a two-volume survey of all world history everywhere, uh, <laughs> explaining uh, how and why it works and where things yeah. have come from and gotten. Uh, yeah, that's his modest book, okay, uh, his humbled book. Um, <laughs> the, uh, the book started out, you've said, uh, as, and continues to be, as you write it, something of a dialogue with your uh, former advisor, is it not? Explain, right. explain why, what, what to, to everybody else what that means and how and why that plays out. Well, Sam Huntington uh, was a great teacher and a great political scientist. Uh, and in a way, he was responsible for killing modernization theory because the dominant paradigm in the early post-war period in American social science was there was a thing called modernization that was one big happy package. I mean, that's kind of a 
<laughs> brief way of summarizing it, that all the good things like economic growth, uh, democratization, uh, social you know, development, greater individualism, all of these things uh, happen together in Europe and in the new countries, the newly decolonized countries, they would be following on a very similar path. And the central insight that Sam had in that book was that, which all, uh, I'm sorry, this, the book published in 1968, uh, Political Order and Changing Societies, right in the middle of the Vietnam War, uh, was that all good things do not go together. That, for example, rapid economic development or social modernization could actually create unrealistic expectations for change, and if the political institutions had not adjusted, then what you got was disorder and instability rather than modernization. And I think that story has actually played out in quite a number of societies. And so that's the core of, uh, of, of Sam's book that I wanted to preserve and to build on. But, you know, a lot of things had not happened in 1968, so you didn't have the rise of East Asia to you know, economic modernity, they're joining the first world. You didn't have the collapse of communism. And Sam had a lot of strange things in that book. Like he argued that the Soviet Union and China were actually modernized participatory societies, even if they didn't have elections, which now in retrospect looks like a kind of embarrassing <laughs> observation. Uh, and so, you know, just it struck me that there was a lot that really needed to be updated in, in a new version of that book. Uh, but, but the central insight remains the same. You can have economic growth without political modernization. You can have political modernization without economic growth. The different components of political modernization, which are the state, rule of law, and democracy, can all be had in different combinations. And if we look around the world, uh, indeed, some parts are developed. You know, other dimensions are very underdeveloped. And that characterizes, I think, the world today. OK, so let me see if I can put end of history and origins of political order together. It is, if you can manage to combine strong state, yeah. effective state, mm -hmm. accountability, and rule of law, right. you get a functioning solution and a set of institutions that can allow your society and your people to thrive and do well. That constitutes something like an end of history because it's a model that works well and is stable and sustainable over time. But it doesn't inevitably emerge. Right. And although that path represents an end of history or the end of history, you don't necessarily get on an escalator That's right. through development to get there. And you can go off in lots of different ways. And in fact, societies around the world at different times have gone off in different ways. And you've had one or two uh, or none of them in lots of different places. Mm -hmm. And so the end of history turns out to be almost a special case of a larger set of political outcomes, many of which are not the end of history. Well, OK, so there's a reason why that might not be true. But basically, that's the correct historical uh, story, that if you contrast the West, for example, with China, China in that book, and by my account, develops a strong state, a modern state, very early in the third century BC. And it is such a strong state that it's then able to prevent the emergence of other social actors that could challenge its power and do what the English parliament did, which is to basically impose some form of accountability or law uh, on it. Whereas the West had a very peculiar sequence of development because the first thing that they got of the modern trilogy is the rule of law, which really was a medieval, you know, it, it, it really starts with the revival of Roman law and the growth of English common law uh, back in the Middle Ages. And then they get state building, the building of a modern state, after this legal structure has been put in place, which limits the absolutism and the tyranny that, that Western monarchs are uh, capable of. And then at the end of that process, they get democracy uh, in, in Britain and the United States and other places. But China you know, could go on for 2,000 years with just the strong state part of it and without the other couple of components. Now, the optimistic uh, part that I think um, in the end, I still believe is going to lead to convergence is the fact that, first of all, uh, we have now, since the Industrial Revolution, which is only 200 years old, but since the Industrial Revolution, you now have this economic engine that is constantly reshuffling the social deck. 
And so China could go on for 2,000 years as an agrarian society with very little social change, very little change in the governing structures. But today, modern China cannot do this because now they've got a middle class, they've got all these people on Sino Weibo that are twittering you know, to each other and communicating and getting richer and you know, changing their social status independently of the state. And um, whether the Chinese traditional form of authoritarianism can actually accommodate the demands of that kind of a well-educated, prosperous population, I actually doubt, you know. And so that's one sense in which I do think that there is a kind of universalizing uh, characteristic to economic modernization, that it, it creates similar kinds of social structures regardless of the historical, cultural, you know, pathways. And then the other thing is, is a, in a sense, social learning and communication that's fostered by our current situation of globalization. So why are there now like 120 elect, at least electoral democracies in the world today is that people see a model that works and if it works well, they, they imitate it. Whereas for 2,000 years, China and the West could grow up, you know, with very separate institutions with almost no communication or learning or you know, transfer of models between them. So those two factors, I think, uh, are promoting, uh, you know, uh, the, 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 the potential convergence of countries around the world. And that's why the big, you know, question right now is the liberal de democratic model in many ways is not nearly as um, lustrous as it was 20 years ago. And, you know, because the Chinese are doing well and, and in material terms, they're, they're growing very rapidly, people are beginning to rethink, you know, the value of these. I mean, we can discuss, I, I think down the road, our model is still going to uh, win out over them. But a lot of times the, the, these models are legitimated by success. But the point is that this kind of imitation and learning that happens across cultural boundaries now, I think means that not everybody, you know, that the, the historical accidents uh, are not, even if something is a result of a happy historical accident, that doesn't mean that other countries can't then make use of it. Okay, I'm gonna to get to the future of history in a second. So hold off for a second on that. Uh, let's go back. I'm curious that you didn't mention as one of the drivers sort of the progress of the human spirit, which was a whole part of end of history, which is that people want to be free, thumos and all that, they want to excel and they want to develop, yeah. and, and the need for self-expression. Uh, it seemed to me, watching the Arab Spring, this is thumos, you know, unleashed. Yeah, right. So thumos is a Greek word that means it's best translated by spiritedness or pride. And uh, it, you know, it has to, I mean, it actually was a very big theme in my original end of history, which is that this is the part that the economists don't understand because they think it's all just material self-interest. But people want recognition of their dignity uh, as moral agents. And that drives a huge amount of politics, and that's the source of anger, because when you are not adequately recognized, uh, you get mad about it. Or Isn't when, this Mohammed Bouazizi? And Mohammed Bouazizi, I'm a perfect example. So he gets his vegetable cart uh, confiscated. He goes to complain. A policewoman slaps him, insults his family, uh, and so forth. And then he, he immolates himself. And this failure to uh, recognize the dignity of an ordinary citizen is really, I think, the spark that was very resonant for many people across the Arab world. Many people had had Mohammed Bouazizi's experience. I guarantee you, in China, every single week, some peasant gets their land taken away in a corrupt deal between a local party official and a developer, and they're storing up, you know, I think, very similar kind of anger uh, about that. Uh, and that's why uh, I think that what a liberal democracy is uh, it's not just the material ability to pursue your own interest. I think uh, the, the moral significance of a democracy, which is why we have a, a system built around rights, individual rights, is that our political system recognizes that no matter how humble you are, you have a right to participate. Uh, you're not a child. The state doesn't treat you as a, uh, a dependent child in a, in a family that doesn't know uh, what's good for him or her, uh, but rather as an adult. And that, I think, is one of the big moral advantages of, of democracies, is this ability to recognize uh, one's, one's dignity. Okay, so let's go back to this question of contingency uh, versus uh, uh, determinism. Uh, maybe hearing you talk, 
there's something, instead of development, we should think of evolution. Because it's almost like you're saying that the path, that, that there are freak accidents that are like genetic uh, developments yeah. uh, that, that, that come online. And if they work, they take things in a new direction and they get replicated and they have more descendants and so mm -hmm. forth. And so mm -hmm. it won't necessarily happen unless there's some kind of uh, genetic mutation. Mm -hmm. But if that does happen, uh, the, it will, and it, and it is a fit one, it'll uh, play That's out right. in this environment. That's is right. that a, a fair way no, of putting it? Right. So the principle of natural selection in biology is uh, variation and adaptation. So you get random genetic mutation. Some of them are dead ends, but some of them actually turn out to be useful. And so uh, those are the ones that survive. And I think in politics, it's been like that. So, you know, one of the, the I think, amusing stories in my uh, political order book is why did the extended family uh, uh, end in Europe? It ended because some 8th century pope declared uh, different inheritance laws that uh, didn't allow you to divorce, have concubines, uh, uh, or marry uh, any uh, close cousin of yours. And all of these are strategies in tribal society to keep property within the tribe. And so this pope just changed the rules and made that impossible. And within two generations of their conversion to Christianity, all these Germanic barbarians all of a sudden were living in very individual nuclear, I mean, the extended family really collapsed as a result of that. And so this was actually just greed on the part of the Catholic Church because they wanted to get their hands on the you know, the money that was held by these kinship groups. But it meant that Europe's uh, uh, social development at that point was far more individualistic than anything going on in India or the Middle East where tribalism to this day continues to exist. So complete accident, but it sets a, a kind of model for individualism that then leads to economic, you know, it permits economic modernization and then uh, it becomes widely imitated. So there, so you can't predict when these kind of things will happen, but you can say that there are, if they do happen and they're good adaptations or mutations, That's then right. they'll actually go in a certain direction rather than That's another right. direction. So That's is, that, right. is that the way of connecting the contingency yeah, and the thing? I think so. Okay, by the way, we have to have a little pause here because there's a fascinating thing you just made me realize I wanted to bring up to give you a flavor of just how cool Frank's, not just research is and <laughs> mind is, but the kind of weird topics he takes on. Talk a little bit about this kinship issue. And there's this problem, I forget what you call it, but the, uh, how the family members and the kinships are these great, great problems for all societies and figuring out a way around them is one of the key yeah. problems of modern society. Yeah. And well, that all sorts of societies have developed, all sorts of societies have developed ways to guard against the transfer of power and goods to close family members, essentially. Yeah. Well, basically, human biology dictates that we will we're social animals, you know, David Brooks is right about that, uh, but we're social in a certain way by nature. Uh, we favor our genetic relatives and we favor direct face-to-face -face exchanges of reciprocal benefits. Uh, and so you don't have to teach a child how to behave this way. That, you know, they, they just grow up with, with that kind of endowment. And in a sense, to get to a modern society, you have to get beyond friends and family. And so every human society has had a different strategy for doing this. In the Middle East, for example, the whole rise of Islam could be seen as an anti-familistic doctrine because what the Prophet Muhammad said, he grew up in a tribal society, and he said, no, no, you're not a member of the Quraysh tribe, you know, you're not a Hashemite or this and that, you are a Muslim, and this is a universal doctrine that applies to all human beings. Now, unfortunately, in, you know, the part of the tension in the Middle East is that that universalistic message never fully got through and so they remain uh, intensely tribal to the point that uh, the Mamelukes and the Ottomans had to literally kidnap foreigners uh, as slave soldiers, raise them to be administrators because, and, and not permit them to have families because that is the only way that they could get impersonal public administration in... Is that like the eunuchs in China? Yeah, and the eunuchs, I mean, eunuchs are, you know, they're in the Byzantine Empire in China and Turkey. And again, because they could not have children, they're not, uh, they're not a danger, you know, in establishing dynasties. The Catholic Church uh, under Gregory the Seventh in the 11th century uh, goes for celibacy, not because there's a scriptural basis for it, uh, uh, but because at that point when priests could marry and have children, they all started dynasties and they all wanted to do well for their children. And so every society has to figure out some way of protecting itself from 
what Max Weber called patrimonialization, which is basically the reinsertion of friends and family into a modern political order. So you live in near Silicon Valley. Are you saying that the friends and family stock option thing, yeah. the IPOs, yeah. is a legacy of one of the most basic of all human drives? And it's like a sort of yeah. a, a, an appendix every, still stuck there? Every time, uh, well, first of all, when societies get under stress, the repatrimonialization happens. And then, you know, there's a modern, a more modern form of it, which basically I think is, is some version of the rich and powerful getting more rich and more powerful. Uh, and, and this actually happens in periods of peace and prosperity. Uh, and that, you know, is a modern, you know, uh, 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 case of this, that people will always try to take care of their friends and families unless their political system gives them very powerful incentives to, to behave otherwise. Okay, back to our general stream of history now. Uh, you worry, as you mentioned, that the Western model, uh, which was looking so good a generation or two ago, is now somewhat tarnished uh, because uh, it's fraying around the edges, the resources are going ever more to the ever top, uh, the middle class is declining and so forth, and that unless this trend or series of trends can be reversed, uh, some of the positive directionality of history mm -hmm. may not uh, uh, play out the way you had foreseen. Mm -hmm. And this is the focus of your most recent piece uh, in the 90th anniversary issue, yeah. uh, uh, The Future of History. Talk about this for a second. Well, the importance of a broad middle class to stable democracy is something that's been recognized by political thinkers going all the way back to Aristotle. Uh, and in a way, I became the most conscious of this. I've spent a lot of time in Latin America over the last 20 years. And Latin America is democratic, but it's always had this very defective democracy because you build democracy on top of highly unequal societies, where there's a narrow oligarchy that holds most of the political and economic power. And then you know, a lot of um, uh, people that are disenfranchised or impoverished uh, and so forth. And this leads to this constant uh, instability uh, in, in that region. And the reason that you get people like Evo Morales and Hugo Chavez, it, it, you know, it's a symptom of this, uh, of this deeper polarization uh, in the society. Uh, and in fact, uh, the reason that democracy triumphed in the 20th century and the Marxists uh, lost out was that in Western Europe, you didn't have this Latin American form of development. You instead had uh, a much broader middle class where wealth was much more evenly uh, distributed. And so I think that uh, we have to be conscious of the social basis of democracy, that if people don't have a stake, an economic stake, uh, in the political system, or at least believe that the system is fair enough that it, you know, it, it, it's, it's essentially taking, uh, you know, allowing them to, to lead decent lives, then the legitimacy of that system is, is going to be challenged. And so that's the, the problem that I see in growing inequality here. And what are the drivers of this problem that you see? Well, the, the two obvious ones that everybody points to are uh, globalization and technology. So globalization, I mean, that's a familiar uh, uh, issue where with low skill labor, we've now added several hundred million new workers that can do the same work that a lot of Americans do. So we all know about that. Uh, technology, I think, is misunderstood in a certain way. That's probably an even more uh, important driver of inequality because what smart machines do, what all of these smart guys that live around me in Silicon Valley do is they spend their waking hours trying to figure out how to destroy jobs in the rest of the economy. I mean, that's not the way they get up and motivate themselves in the morning, but in effect, they are developing very intelligent machines that can increasingly take over jobs that are done by relatively low skill you know, workers elsewhere. That's why American productivity has been going up so much is that, you know, and when all these, you know, manufacturing plants now come back to the United States, they hire very few workers because they're highly automated based on, you know, very sophisticated uh, machines. And so those are two big forces that are out there that we can't really do that much about. Nobody's going to stop, well, uh, except at the margins. But I think the third um, issue is public policy because uh, you, can, you can undertake public policies that help societies adjust to these big changes that no one can do anything about. Karl Polanyi, the, the, you know, the great uh, Hungarian uh, economist, 
wrote about this, this dual movement that the economy moves, but society has to, in a way, play this catch-up game. And unless the institutions allow the society to adjust, you're going to have really big problems. And I think that the United States, Britain, uh, have embraced uh, this shift towards a post-industrial society a little bit too readily. And uh, we've kind of assumed that, well, yeah, we'll, we'll help the losers out in, in all of this. And we've just not done a very good uh, job at that. And, and I think, actually, the alternative to our approach to globalization is not some economic nationalist. It's, it's really the Germans. I actually think the Germans come out right now looking pretty good because they've, you know, they've accepted globalization. They're the second largest exporter in the world. But they've actually managed to pre uh, preserve a lot more of their manufacturing base and their skills uh, that are necessary to, you know, to, to maintain that position, despite the fact that they're very integrated into the global economy. And so I think we just need to rethink, uh, uh, rethink some of that. Occupy Wall Street, good or bad? Well, I think <laughs> it's a good thing because it, it's put the question of inequality back on the agenda. Uh, when Obama in 2008 used the word redistribution, John McCain and all the Republicans jumped all over him and said, this is class warfare. Uh, and there was a very long period when uh, conservatives would not even admit that equality, inequality, growing inequality was a reality, or if it was a reality that it actually had any social significance. And now I think the, uh, the discussion has actually changed because people, you know, act, even conservatives now will admit that this has happened, and a lot of them are beginning to actually try to think through whether this could be destabilizing for the system as a whole. So Charles Murray, who is a famous conservative author and a libertarian, has just written a book uh, about uh, the split between the white working class and the white upper class, and how over the past 30 years, these two groups have just gone in completely uh, opposite and very, you know, very disturbing uh, directions. So, I'm sure he didn't write that because of Occupy Wall Street, but I think, in a way, Occupy Wall Street is, is you know, one manifestation of a shift in the national conversation that is, for the first time, actually taking some of these economic class issues seriously. So pure good? Well, you, okay, you're so harsh this on is, the left. In I'm the, harsh on the left, yeah. I in, mean, in I, well, for, for quite a number of reasons. So. Um, one, one problem with the left is that I think that they have gotten themselves sidetracked into a lot of peripheral cultural issues. Uh, so a lot of the agenda, you know, having to do with identity politics, gay rights, feminism, uh, racial politics, and so, you know, every one of those issues may be perfectly justified in itself, but it, what it's done is it's disconnected the contemporary left from the working class in the United States that has actually been injured by these economic policies. And so this is the problem you know, in, in, in what's wrong with Kansas. I mean, this, this discussion that you get all of these uh, working class whites that vote for Republicans who support policies that actually are making their economic situation worse. And part of the reason for that is that they you know, really distrust and, and dislike the liberal cultural elite that on these cultural issues you know, doesn't, have, uh, doesn't have their values. And I think that actually the Democratic Party is really not going to do well until they figure out how to define an agenda that brings all those Reagan Democrats or you know, kind of working class Democrats more reliably back, uh, you know, back into the fold. The, the, other, the other big problem, I think, is that, that, that the really big danger is there's a lot of populism in the air right now. There's a lot of anger. Uh, the Tea Party was the first big manifestation after the financial crisis. So on talk radio and, and you know, in commentaries on blogs, everybody is just hopping mad about Goldman Sachs and the bailouts and, uh, and so forth. But it's a very unfocused anger. And the, the, the hesitation I had in writing that article for you is if I start saying, well, we actually have to walk back a little bit from this globalization model that we all thought was great in the 1990s. Uh, that will legitimate, you know, you're starting down this slippery slope where you end up with a kind of economic nationalism and protectionism that 
could really be dangerous given how much anger there is out there. And so this is an issue that I think the political system has not really dealt with adequately. There is a demand for a sensible set of policies that will protect the middle class better than we've been doing it, but that hopefully will not lead us back into, you know, Smoot Hawley and, and the kind of overt economic nationalism that really led the Western world into a disaster in the 1930s. Okay. We were talking before uh, the event about how, in one sense, things have, history has, with a capital H, has slowed down a bit, come to some kind of, if not end, then at least uh, uh, the caravan, the Kozhev's caravan has come to a large sort of caravanserai and is staying there for a while. Uh, you can explain that image if you want. Uh, uh, but that there are some other drivers of change. Uh, biology, yeah. biotechnology, wrote an entire book on our post-human future. Right. Uh, and technology in general. People don't know this. Frank actually has a pair of drones of his own. Uh, they go very well with the council's black helicopters. Uh, but, uh, and, and he fantasizes about uh, flying his drones over to look at Steve Jobs' uh, bees, uh, because his wife also uh, uh, has bees. Uh, and the idea that you have personal drones flying around uh, in, your, in your yard. I actually have pictures of Frank's drones. There's one of them. Uh, uh, you know, the, 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 are we going in so fast in technology and human uh, biotechnology that all these broad discussions of history uh, and the broad patterns are going to be basically out of uh, Yeah, out of well, the, the, the broad impact of biomedicine uh, is one of those things that is going to have an enormous um, uh, impact in, in the future. And it, it already is, is doing that. So in every um, advanced country and now increasingly in a lot of developing countries, you are passing the, the, you know, this reproductive uh, threshold where you're getting falling populations. It's totally disastrous in Asia. So greater Tokyo area has a total fertility rate of less than one. Uh, it's close to one in South Korea, in Taiwan, in Singapore. Uh, basically, it's actually interesting. I mean, uh, I, I think that it's actually the lowest in those countries where there's a lot of educated women and relatively socially conservative mores because essentially once educated women, you know, are in that situation, they, they stop having children because they don't want to have this, this traditional um, uh, social role. Uh, so this means that it, it, the, the demographic structure of all advanced uh, democratic countries is in the process of changing uh, so that the population pyramids that used to have you know, relatively few old people, lots of young people, now looks like a trapezoid and pretty soon is going to look like one of those Greek urns where you've got, you know, in, I mean, the, the median age, uh, you know, Nick Eberstadt, the demographer, you know, estimates that by 2050, there's, um, uh, uh, you're going to have 50% 50, uh, 50 of the population of Europe is going to be over the age of, uh, of 65, you know, and only 5% of Italians are going to have any kind of collateral relatives at all because everybody is just going to have essentially one uh, child. So we know what kind of stress this is already going to put on healthcare systems and uh, social security systems because every welfare state social contract was written in a different age when there was a higher birth rate and people didn't live as long. And I think that the cumulative impact of future biomedicine is just going to make this worse. Because if you think about it, the ideal way for a person to die, assuming that we have to die sooner or later, is for all of our systems to shut down simultaneously within a one or two week period. I mean, that would be great if that's the way everybody could depart the world. But what biomedicine has done is selectively fix certain parts of the human system and not others. So for example, Alzheimer's, uh, Parkinson's, these are degenerative diseases that correlate heavily to age. So by the time you get to be 85, you know, roughly half the population uh, has uh, one or another of them. And the reason there's an explosion of these diseases is because people are not dying of heart attacks, strokes, you know, other things. And I think, uh, you know, and this is where the productivity is going to be very dicey because I think so much of the future uh, investment and scientific and technological gains are going to come in this area of biomedicine that is then going to have this very hard to predict 
uh, impact on the nature of societies. You, you know, but I think it's pretty safe to assume that lifetimes are going to be extended even further, which means more stress on the existing social contracts and the need to uh, adjust to them. So that part of it, I think, is, you know, is troubling. I could talk to you all night because there's so many topics here, but I want to bring our other participants into the discussion. So uh, with that, let's, uh, let's go to the audience for some questions for Frank Fukuyama. Yes, over here. Wait for a mic to come and please state your name and affiliation. Right there. Thank you. Uh, I'm Uldis Blukas from uh, Emeritus from Brooklyn College, City University. Uh, my question is about an omission both in this conversation and also in your latest article in the Foreign Affairs, especially about the ideology of future. Seems to me that we are living in a time that is uh, totally unprecedented, extremely unprecedented, namely starting from a broad base at roughly the beginning of the 19th century, uh, the human consumption has increased by uh, 100 to 1,000 fold, and we are living on a uh, finite planet with finite resources. Uh, it seems to me that many of those who are paying attention to it are uh, suggesting that uh, the problems are already showing up quite widely. Uh, however, you gentlemen don't deal with it at all. I was wondering no. why. <laughs> Are we going to face some kind of resource or environmental crash? By the way, we have a piece in the next no, issue of the magazine. not necessarily crash. No, let's not over-dramatize it. Okay. Just problems. <laughs> problems. <laughs> we have, uh, I should plug our next issue, by the way. Not only do we have a piece on uh, uh, fertility and birth rates and, and natal, pro-natalist policies, which makes exactly the point you made, uh, but uh, uh, also one on the Club of Rome and its uh, later uh, uh, right. epigons. So. Well... Uh, I didn't talk about this because I think that I am completely open to a very bad scenario happening, which is uh, a return to basically a Malthusian kind of world. So Thomas Malthus wrote his essay on population in 1798, just at the cusp of the Industrial Revolution. And everybody today laughs at him, you know, saying, he didn't understand how uh, productivity increases were going to keep up with population uh, over the next 200 years. Having written this book that basically starts with primates and works its way up you know, to the 18th century, when you take this longer term view, 200 years is nothing. You know? And we've been living in this blessed period where you do have this continual technological process. We have this great uh, faith that the technology will solve the problems that it itself creates because that's been the pattern over this past 200 years. But there's absolutely no reason to assume that this is going to continue to happen. And so if it becomes the case that you cannot solve some of the resource questions, uh, you know, and, and you just think about it. So if China with 1.3 billion, India with over a billion people live at an American standard of living you know, consuming the resources that Americans consume, you know, it's, system's going to break down. I mean, it, it, you know, unless you have, unless you can presume extremely great advances in technology that, that solve some of these issues, um, which may or may not happen. And at that point, you get back into this Malthusian world in which uh, actually there isn't growth for everybody. And, and this is a very important point. I think the, uh, democracy, modern democracy, capitalist democracy, really depends on your not living in a Malthusian world. Because democracy, you know, capitalism produces inequalities. The only reason that people tolerate that is because the pie is growing and everybody is benefiting to some extent. And if you return to a Malthusian kind of zero-sum world, then all bets are off, right? So we didn't talk about this because it's a pretty depressing subject. And, <laughs> and honestly, I don't know how to talk about it because other than speculating, you know, I, I just, all I can say is that it will depend on, on, you know, the way technology plays out in the future. And you can imagine scenarios where it saves itself and you can imagine very bad ones. Soylent green is voters doesn't really work well, I think, right? <laughs> so, okay, next question. Yes, in the back here.
Hi, thanks for coming. Uh, my name is Gabriel Sub. I'm a student uh, at Bard College. Um, I'm very interested in the political phenomenon of populism, which you briefly talked about. I thought you did a very good job outlining the circumstances which lead to um, its prevalence. Um, in light of that, I was wondering, um, with the strength of this conservative, I'll broadly call it anti-populist or anti-immigrant populism, um, and the failures of the left, which I think you also eloquently stated, um, where do you see constructive reform coming uh, in liberal democracies. Are you hopeful for that? Do you think it's possible? Where will it come from, et cetera? Yeah, if the left is in trouble and the right is in trouble, where, is, where does your great where political you hope come from? Yeah. Well, you know, populist anger can actually be politically useful. So you think about the Great Depression and, you know, the New Deal. Uh, people were really in bad shape and it created a lot of anger and resentment. But you know, Roosevelt was able, I mean, you may not like the welfare state he created in all of its aspects, but it led to a positive uh, uh, agenda where that populist anger could be channeled into concrete policies that arguably, you know, uh, help the country. Uh, what I find puzzling about what's going on right now is that there's a lot of populist anger, but it all seems directed at the wrong targets. And so they, you know, the, the Tea Party folks, uh, don't like Goldman Sachs, and they don't like the fact that we had to bail out the banks, but then they vote for Republican politicians that don't want to regulate the banks, you know, and, and it just doesn't, you know, uh, it doesn't make sense. In Europe, I think you got a very similar phenomenon. The whole European Union was a, an elite-driven creation, and in fact, you know, they, every now and then they put it up for a vote about the Masaryk Treaty or something, and, and when the people said, no, we don't want this, they'd say, oh, you're wrong. You actually do want it, so let's just hold another referendum, and you keep voting until you, you know, you vote the right way. And so the result is that throughout Europe, and particularly in Northern Europe, where the, they really have to pay for all these policies, in Finland, Sweden, Holland, Germany, well, not Germany so much, but every one of these has now got a fairly significant anti-immigrant, Euroskeptic uh, uh, party. Uh, and again, uh, I think that that part is going to get worse with the kind of deepening of the EU that's now being planned because there's no grassroots support for this anywhere. This is another elite uh, project. And so this is what I would watch for uh, in, in, in Europe. I think sensibly what that ought to tell European politicians is that they ought to slow down and rethink you know, uh, exactly what it is uh, they're doing. Uh, how <clears throat> I would channel this, that's why I said in my article, I, I didn't put forward a program. I said, someone brighter than me has to come up with this. You know, how to channel this anger into a constructive program that will not just go back to the old, you know, kind of social democratic solutions, because there's many parts of the old welfare state that we tried to uh, construct that just don't work very well. So we need a new model. Uh, we need a new program that's not economic nationalism, but it's also not globalization, and I'm just not smart enough to, and, then, and, and furthermore, even if you can think, through, like Danny Roderick actually at Harvard has a pretty good, you know, kind of technical program that defines what something like that would look like, but in addition to that, you've got to market it politically. Somebody's got to be able to get up in front of American voters and say, this is your problem, and this is a solution to your problem, and that's a big gap in political entrepreneurship that no one has managed to, um, you know, to solve. So. Did you hope that Obama could be that person? Uh, yeah, well, I, I voted for Obama because I thought that that 2008 election coming right on the heels or in the midst of this big crisis would be in a, in a sense like a replay of the 1932 election where you'd have a realignment and, uh, and so forth. Now, the truth of the matter is that actually Obama was elected not because of their, a big realignment, but just because a lot of centrist voters were really sick and tired of George W. Bush. And so he really didn't have the mandate uh, to then push for a much more progressive policy. We could, this is another discussion. I think he also tactically made a lot of mistakes you know, in, the, in that first year. Uh, so it was a disappointment. And he, you know, I think he, he could have channeled that in a, in a more effective way. Next question. Uh... Yes, in the back here. Hi, University. I don't know if the mic's working. Um, what is your forecast for the future of China over the next 10, 15 years? 
Um, well, I find it hard to believe that China is going to continue to look as good in 10 or 15 years as it does right now. Right now, it looks like they make quick decisions, pretty good macroeconomic policy management. They've overseen this miraculous transformation of uh, their society, but they've got big hidden liabilities, which in a way are illustrated by that high-speed rail accident. Right? So they spend a few hundred billion dollars putting in place this high-speed rail system that is you know, just a miracle. I mean, California <laughs> has been trying to do this, and you know, maybe in my lifetime they'll get around to laying the first mile of track, but the Chinese did this in about three, four years. But it turns out, you know, as a result of that accident, that there's shoddy construction. The head of the railway ministry was canned because evidently there was a lot of corruption uh, in that. Uh, and then what, what are the, what's the first thing that they do when this accident happens? The railway ministry buries the railroad cars so that nobody will actually be able to find out what the cause of the accident is. And I just do not think that you can run a modern society with that little transparency and open discussion about social problems. And, um, and as I said, you know, the moral basis of the society is, is very weak. There's a lot of anger uh, out there. They've tried to justify themselves on some combination of Chinese nationalism plus very weird Marxism-Leninism, none of which I think really resonates with a lot of Chinese people. And so, uh, and, and then the economic model is going to lose steam. And I think it's going to lose steam, you know, um, earlier rather than later. So I just think that uh, they need democracy. <laughs> you know, they, they really need a, a system where officials can be held accountable for corruption, incompetence, poor decision making. And the only way that ultimately you can do that is by having a free press, by having you know, democratic accountability from the grassroots uh, up. So I still am betting, you know, uh, I, 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 for all of our problems, I still, you know, I, I, my bets are on us. Okay. Another question? Yes, over here. Hi, um, I'm Abby Zwick with Bard College. Um, you've talked about China, but I was just wondering if you could also talk a little more about um, the Southeast Asia region, particularly Indonesia, and uh, where they stand in this Indonesia. <laughs> well, ask Mr. Wizard, come on. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, if you talk about the region as a whole, actually, let's start with Thailand, because that actually illustrates uh, an important point about the middle class. Uh, when Thailand got democracy in the early 90s, it was powered by the rising middle class. You know, there was an economic miracle going on. And when the coup deposed Thaksin there a few years ago, that was also led by the middle class. And so the middle class is not an inevitable supporter of democracy. Uh, and in particular, when you have a narrow middle class who, whose interests can be threatened by the threat of redistribution and economic populism, which is what Thaksin represented, then they don't support democracy. And that's, I think, the story of China right now have maybe 300 million middle class Chinese. And I think they recognize uh, largely that if you had democracy tomorrow, it would unleash huge demands for redistribution and would kill the goose that's been laying this, this golden egg for them. Uh, Indonesia, I think, proves a number of very interesting things. First of all, you can have a reasonably successful democracy uh, in a Muslim country. Uh, the transition to democracy. It was messy, but it actually worked much, much better than anyone hoped for. But it doesn't look very appealing the closer you look at it. And the reason is corruption. Uh, it, it's, it's poor governance. Uh, so you had big time corruption on the part of the Suhardo family uh, at the end of his rule. And now it's all become retail corruption because it's all, you know, they've decentralized the government. So at every level of the Indonesian government, people have opportunities to steal. And so I think that uh, you know, that's really the central problem is dealing, you know, uh, they've got the democracy part. They've kind of got uh, a rule of law. What they don't have is a state that can actually, and, 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 and to be fair to them, compared to other countries, you know, if you compare Indonesia and Nigeria, they're light years ahead of, Indo uh, of Nigeria, you know. So they do things, they've done things reasonably well. But the next stage of their development really, I think, is 
developing a competent state that can get past a lot of the current corruption problems that, that they face. Otherwise, you know, I think it is going to delegitimize uh, their democracy. We've, we're getting near the witching hour. I want to take the final question myself and go in an odd direction. We've, we've done history and theory, even policy. I want to conclude with methodology. Uh, you're obviously something of a polymath and you're obviously you know, unique uh, and nothing generates this. But it's, you're not unique in the questions you've tackled. Uh, you've talked about your advisor and your mentors. There were whole generations of social scientists in the past who did this. There's a whole tradition of historical sociology that grapples with these questions. Do you think that our graduate education and our broader social uh, uh, discourse is adequately geared toward generating people who can take part in these kinds of discussions, address the sorts of issues we've been talking about, and if not, what sorts of changes are appropriate and required for, to, to generate more people who can have discussions like this? So Gideon, you're winding up this big softball pitch, you know, straight into my, <laughs> over the batter's box here. Yeah, I think that the social sciences in the United States are facing a real crisis, and I think it stems from the dominance of neoclassical economics over the, you know, the whole field. Uh, I think that the whole economics profession needs a really, really big rethink. Uh, and, and partly it's, you know, the rise of economics. I think that contemporary American social science understands how the world actually works and how human beings behave uh, in many respects less well than they did two, three generations ago when they didn't have this narrow, you know, rational uh, self-interest model uh, 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 that they work from. Now, of course, they broadened beyond that, and there's been some reform movements from within. But in my discipline, in political science, you know, the economists have taken over the political science field, and they brought their models into the understanding of, of human uh, political behavior uh, as well. And so, for example, the the importance of social norms of uh, you know, moral considerations, the importance of ideas as, as drivers of uh, human behavior, uh, that's completely missing from this, uh, you know, this methodological approach because every, you want to convert everything into a mathematizable model that's based on some reduced form of self-interest and it just makes people stupider than, you know, than they should be because actually the world is much more complex, people operate out, you know, and I actually began my career as a student of Alan Bloom, as you know, I did humanities. I, I did a lot of political uh, theory, which is why the whole idea that there's this thing called thumos, you know, was part of my education. That that human beings are not just driven by material gain, but they're also driven by the need for recognition and uh, and dignity. And I think you're not going to have an adequate social science until you begin to reintroduce some of this complexity, and then it's going to not look as much like a science because once you admit all these different variables and all this complexity and all the variance in outcomes, you can't have simple theories. You just can't. You may not be able to have theory at all. On that note, gentlemen, thank you very much. Thanks, Thanks for sharing.